Hey everybody, it's Ian O'Byrne again. I'm taking a look at uh, issue number 116 of my newsletter, Too Long Didn't Read. Um, this one was a lot of fun to put together, but honestly, at times it took me a little bit longer than I wanted to because I couldn't pay attention. I was focusing on talking with a bunch of people on Slack and elsewhere. Uh, the kids are out of the house, the wife is out of the house uh, traveling, and so because I wasn't pressed, I was goofing off. Um, but I like the way that it all came together. There's a lot of elements that I've been thinking about throughout the week. And so I want to take a little peek at it with you. Um, so once again, 116 is there. I shared two of the videos that I created this week on my use of Google Keep. Uh, I've been meaning to put these videos together for a while. Um, at this point, I have two others that I want to put together. Um, but I haven't yet. And the main reason I haven't put it together yet is because I'm waiting for the reflector app i've been test driving a bunch of different apps to uh, mirror my device or devices to my computer so i can put together videos um, that's on the horizon i also foresee that my uh, use of youtube is going to start to put the camera uh, facing me um, so it'll be more than just my melodious voice or cantankerous droning voice on the video and uh, you can see my shaved head <laughs> um, so that's on its way um, but basically I have my two videos about keep and how I use it to keep notes and also use it as I write uh, I've been meaning to do this and a lot of this was motivated by work that I've seen Doug and Aaron talking about speaking about Aaron and Doug I uh, got a nice note from Aaron this past week and also Melissa thank you very much for sending me notes I really appreciate it, it makes me feel like this work is worthwhile um, and I talk about the video here. Um, it's kind of funny this week. I had a student in class all of a sudden stop me and say, uh, I have a question for you, but this is a little bit out of the ordinary. And I'm like, absolutely. Those are the best kinds of questions. And we're talking about digital identity and putting content online and, and the work that I'm asking them to do. And she said, well, how do people make money on YouTube? And I, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, three days later, uh, Richard Byrne has a post where he talks about how people make money on YouTube. Um, so it's a really interesting look at, um, you know, the, the uh, mechanics involved in it. Uh, a little bit, in, a little bit uh, scary, I guess, because you think about the algorithms and the ads and how it places the, the person or the individual with the ad. Um, so definitely worth watching, um, especially if you're working with students in, in K-12 or, you know, middle school and high school and beyond to talk about their use of these digital technologies and how these algorithms are tracking them. Uh, this is a piece uh, in the Atlantic talking about how we really, from the most, for all intents and purposes, we already live inside the computer. Uh, a couple of interesting pieces. It is a long read, but a couple interesting pieces in there, um, you know, that focusing on our use of these technologies and how we're pretty much stuck in it already um, you know and, and we don't really seek out computers to get things done anymore um, for all you know many times we seek out things to do so that it will let us use a computer um, and so it makes me question my own use of these devices and how much time I spend in front of them also I recommend this piece on the sociology, the smartphone, another long read. But if you liked some of the discussions that we had last week about the iPhone, uh, it's definitely something to check out. Uh, another piece that was a bit of a long read in The Guardian on Facebook's war on free will. It was, a, it was an interesting piece because he basically takes us on a look through Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the founder or one of the founders, depending on how you look at it, of Facebook. And some of the challenges um, throughout his upbringing and some of his philosophy and ethos and a lot of that hacker ethos that he brought into Facebook and some of it still is there. Um, and it's interesting to me because we think about there's a lot of talk about how Zuckerberg is starting to think politically and may or may not run for president or whatever. Um, but he's on this like very interesting like public relations tour around the U.S. right now. And so this is one of those pieces that I think that it's something that would be interesting to keep in your back pocket for a couple years from now. Um, this might be one of those pieces where all of a sudden two years from now we look back and say, oh, that's really interesting or that's kind of disturbing. Um, so definitely want to keep a hand on this one for a later date. 
Also last week we talked a little bit about Reddit and the changes to the terms of service and, and how they were using it to police hate speech. Um, I asked the question and, and many of you responded, is there a need to have a terms of use or a terms of service for freedom of speech? And pretty much at the same time going on with this thread of serendipity in this week's issue, uh, Doug Belshaw has been doing some work looking at codes of conduct and, you know, for a, a, a company he's working for. And so he pulled together a lot of different codes of conduct that were interesting to look at how people identify this. I think this has a lot of import in online communities that you're a part of, but also online communities that you might try to create. Um, I was interested in the, the different versions that they have out there, um, and then also what should be as you know included as part of it. I've written a lot lately about um, acceptable use policies. I had to do an encyclopedia piece on acceptable use policies in terms of service and stuff like that. And so it's interesting to think about, well, how do we sort of police and or positively or negatively um, guide behaviors online. So it's something really interesting to take a look at, especially for those of you that are uh, thinking about these behaviors online and things that we could or should do. Another piece in the World Economic Forum uh, blog about the future of work and what our children, what skills our children need. We see these posts come up every like six to eight weeks in World Economic Forum and sometimes they pretty much identify the same skill set over and over and over and you wonder like what is new or different about this one. There are a couple different things in here that you know really uh, stuck out to me. The critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, we've seen that again and again. The agility and adaptability, it's a little bit more progressive than some of the other lists, so I really appreciate that. The oral written communication, accessing analyzing info. I like the analyzing info part because we think about data management, and that's a big thread or that's a need in my program not right now. Um, the curiosity and imagination I like. But what really interests me is the initiative and entrepreneurialism piece. Um, so this, this idea about entrepreneurial learning or entrepreneurial work um, is something that I see pop up again and again. I went to a, a symposium about a month ago and I talked about it in the newsletter where we, yeah, the assembled group, was a lot of deans and superintendents and, and administrators and then also like um, politicians from the, the local area. And they had people come in to talk about the critical teacher shortage and what we could possibly do. And one of the things that some of the presenters kept saying is, you know, there is there's a need for entrepreneurial learners. And it, it started to ask it started to make me think about like, well, what is entrepreneurial learners or what is this entrepreneurial learning or what do we mean when we say that students need to think entrepreneurially? Um, it's one of those things where when people are doing it, you can talk to them and say, okay, well, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but this looks like entrepreneurial thinking or entrepreneurial learning. Um, and so that's really been intriguing me lately. I'd, I'd be interested in reaching out to some of these people that do this and say, okay, well, how would you define this? Because we're trying to make this happen elsewhere. And in order to have it help happen elsewhere, I think we need to define it. Um, this is another piece that came out in the, the Guardian. Um, the reason that really intrigued me is that it was one of the, um, it was an alternate viewpoint on some of the coding and programming initiatives that are out there. So we look at the big tech push for coding and programming in our schools and we think about, okay, well, why are they doing this? And um, why is code.org so incredible? And why is Scratch providing all these materials? And, and Google's all in on these coding games and programming games. Like, why is it there? And, you know, altruistically, I was thinking, well, you know, they want kids to code and I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the low country that I'm in right now. That's the name for Charleston and, and the local area. But Charleston is supposedly, Charleston, South Carolina supposedly is, you know, some people call us Silicon Harbor. We have a lot of business, a lot of companies. Google's here. Um, BMW is not far off uh, in South Carolina, but Boeing is right nearby and Volvo. And a lot of tech companies are moving into the area. And 
we look at the need for highly trained, skilled workers for these environments. Um, and there's not a lot of them. And so we want to think about how we get more coding and programming and, and that sort of thought in our classrooms. Well, Tarnoff in this piece basically takes an alternate point of view, and it's really an interesting one to think about. You know, maybe the, it's not an altruistic goal to just have kids code and understand the power of coding and programming and make it cool. Maybe it's to, it's an economic one. Maybe they're trying to sort of force wages down um, and and put a you know a glut of workers out in the market. Something to think about. Um, and then once again, in the bottom, I linked to a piece that I had um, with a, a couple colleagues of mine in Jal uh, about a year and a half ago on computational thinking and participation. So if you're thinking about coding and programming. Um, I don't think that the goal of this in our classroom is to make every kid a coder or a programmer. I think that the goal should be, and this is for all students, the goal should be on how can we bring more algorithmic thinking into the classroom. You know, how can we embed aspects of computational thinking and, you know, perhaps computational participation into what we do. So it's something to check out if you haven't seen it already. One of the other things that I was intrigued by this week was this uh, uh, Quizlet, one of the tools that I use for my classes, Quizlet added in interactive diagrams. Um, I think we see something like this in ThingLink, uh, another program that I use in, in my classrooms, but I use Quizlet a lot. I use it I uh, for most of my classes. I'll add the vocab from the chapters into Quizlet for students, or I'll have them add it to it and then share it from semester to semester so that they can quickly support their own learning if they want to. They don't have to. Um, so this use of interactive diagrams on Quizlet, what I might do in future classes is have students create some content in Quizlet using these interactive diagrams and see what they can build. Uh, when I was creating this week's uh, newsletter, I was thinking a lot about free will um, and this quote by Sam Harris spoke to me and I was thinking about uh, a lot of the power involved in it. Um, this was a long week. It was a tough week. Uh, there's a lot of different things happening. There was, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're thinking about whether or not this other storm, you know, will come into the area and classes were getting back up on uh, to speed. Uh, a lot of different things happening. So I thought that this was a nice empowering quote to have us think about you know, the real opportunities that we have out there. Uh, I want to share a couple other th cool things with you. Um, one big question that I have and one fun thing that I was thinking about or doing this week. Um, one of the big questions that I've had over the last couple days that's really been perplexing me is what's the difference between fact and one's personal experience? And what I mean by that is you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook and I'm looking at friends and family and they're arguing about political things. And, and one family member will say, hey, you know, uh, we need this legislation or we don't need this le legislation because, and they'll just explain, you know, this is what I think it'll do to the economy or to people's lives or whatever. And then as a response to that, somebody else will come in and they'll say, fact check. I went to the store and, and I bought this and this is what it, you know, it cost me or I went to the doctor and this is what I was charged. Um, and so what I'm wondering is like if one person experiences it, you know, if I go to the store tonight and I buy a gallon, you know, or a bottle of milk for $10 and I come back and I say I bought a bottle of milk for $10, that's my personal experience. It's not, it's not an opinion. It's not a belief. I went to the store. I spent 10 bucks on a bottle of milk. Okay. But then if I get into a discussion or an argument with you, is that fact? Is it fact that I spent 10 bucks on that bottle of milk? Well, yeah, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. So when we talk about these bigger issues, what is the difference between fact and your personal experience? So yeah, it's something that happened to you. It's not an opinion. It's not your belief. But does it really count if it's one person? I don't know. Um, I would like to believe that fact is something that a bunch of people agree upon a bunch of people in different settings and scenarios all agree and there's not a lot of bias we all have bias and perspective but i'd like to think some that that fact is something 
bigger than just one person experiencing it. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm trying to tease out, and I've been doing a lot of reading online. And one last thing that was a lot of fun is uh, yesterday I was driving around and I saw, I was listening to the radio, um, and there was a four non-blondes. Uh, four non-blondes? Is it four non-blondes? Hold on a second. Yeah, Four Non Blondes uh, song was on the radio, and I was listening to it and singing along, and then I basically took the lyrics and I uh, remixed it and sent it out to my friends on Facebook. And it was really interesting seeing like some of the people. Uh, I know that somebody down below wrote something inappropriate, so I'm going to stop there. But it was interesting seeing what people wrote and what people shared. So it was a, a, a nice pickup to the week. Um, but once again, this is... Uh, a, a behind the scenes of what's happened this week in my life. This is behind the scenes of issue 116 of TLDR. If you have not subscribed yet to TLDR, uh, what is your problem? In all seriousness, uh, Too Long Didn't Read is my newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter. It's quirky. It's free. It's informative. I think that there's a lot of things happening in this intersection of literacy, technology, and education. Um, and I try to provide an overview and keep track of some of these elements that are changing. So once again, thanks for listening. Hope you had a great week, and I'll see you next week for these behind the scenes and for other stuff online. By all means, subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Uh, thumbs up or thumbs down if you didn't like this video. Uh, give me some feedback and let me know what you think, and thanks again.